You are listening to Essence, a podcast about story, journey, and self. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Essence, a podcast about journey, story, and self. I, of course, am Ben Stimson, your host, and Essence is a part of Paducah Wellness, my counseling practice located in Ontario, Canada. On today's show, I'm very pleased to uh, sit down uh, and speak with somebody I've been following for almost probably about six years now. Pax Gray is a podcaster. He is an educator in his muggle life. Um, he is a spiritual journeyer. He's had led a very interesting spiritual journey. And he is also a facilitator. And uh, I've followed him, as I said, about five or six years now. But it was only until really recently that we really connected and uh, and started speaking. And it turns out that he's a good friend of one of my best friends. So we had that little bit in common there. Um, his story is very interesting in and of itself. And around the same time that I was putting Essence together, he was putting his own podcast together. He has a couple more episodes out than I do, and uh, I'm slowly catching up. Um, he's He grew up in a, a very evangelical Christian household. Um, he found himself uh, shunned from that community when he started to realize his homosexuality, that he was gay. Um, he went into the, uh, to become a monk. That didn't work for him. He found uh, Hinduism and started to explore Hinduism and uh, as well as paganism and witchcraft. Um, and we're going to talk about that journey for him through his spiritual life, interconnected with his sexuality and interconnected with social justice, um, which has some of the which has been a theme in his life all the way through. We're going to talk about what it's been like for him to step into that place of uh, facilitating a podcast, being an interviewer, and also being an interviewee, uh, which is a very different experience, especially for people like myself and him who are introverts, um, and what it's been like for him to build a, a podcast, um, which I was very interested in hearing about because um, my own journey being a podcaster myself. So I hope you enjoy today's chat. Um, I will post the details for his uh, podcast down below. And without further ado, let's dive right in. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I am very delighted to have a uh, an acquaintance and hopefully fast friend, um, Pax, on the show today. Pax is a fellow podcaster. He's just debuted his podcast around the same time I debuted this one. Um, I've been following Pax on his social media for about five years now, and uh, and I was keen to have him on the show to ask him about his spiritual journey, uh, his uh, his feelings on on love, life, and the world around us, um, and his uh, his uh, journey through podcasting so far. So welcome, Pax. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So Pax, I want to start off the show. Um, for people who may not be aware of your of, uh, of kind of your journey and who you are already, um, you've had quite a, a, a spiritual journey, haven't you? Well, it's a hot mess. It's a <laughs> winding, winding road of every which way. So. <laughs> Can you um can you begin with kind of where what where are your roots where where do you come from and kind of where like give us a, a the Coles Notes version of, of of what what your life has been. Sure, uh, I was uh, raised in the Panhandle of Oklahoma and to nominally Christian family, and I say that and even so, one of my first books I remember um, having was my mom's book on tarot, the yellow and white book. And I remember looking at the images before I could even read the words and being fascinated by the mystical, fascinated by what was in there. Um, but I had Pentecostal preacher uncles on both sides of the family. That kind of mm -hmm. says where, where we came from. And with that journey in high school, I converted to fundamentalist Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, in Southern, Southern Baptist church. Southern and Baptist church. Mm -hmm. yeah, and wound up becoming a youth intern working at the church and then in college signed up to be a missionary and so i went from podunk oklahoma and they sent me to los angeles california <laughs> to live in a home um, with guys that they bring in from prison to get off of drugs um so it was um 
a big experience, a big change. Um, and one of the other pieces of that was that um, working in college ministry as well there. And that was my first exposure to feminists, to gay rights advocates, to many different types of people I'd never had any concept of at all. And it was there that I began to, to, to realize I might be one of them and wrote back asking uh, for prayer, for homosexual in inclinations. And with that, they brought me home and held a public shining. It was actually open to the whole community where they, they turned their backs and basically say, you know, we deliver you unto Satan, you know, that you might be saved in the last day. And it's an idea that maybe you'll come to true repentance and not feel that. But, um, that was very traumatic. Obviously, I was hoping to go into ministry. Yes. And still hadn't accepted my sexuality down the road. Um, I converted to Catholicism and determined to become a monk so I could just be celibate. And I did. I became a Marianist monk. Can I ask um, you a little bit about that before absolutely. we can move forward? That's quite a leap. I mean, I, I come from a, a community in Canada here that is very, a lot of fundamentalist churches, a lot of Protestant churches, right? To go from very like Southern Baptist, like fire and brimstone to Catholicism. That's right. quite a leap. What, what, what kind of interested you in that? Um, you know, initially it was the idea of just being celibate. And so it was the only church I knew of that, had any type of, you know, place for celibate people, because again, I hadn't accepted my sexuality fully. And so it was like, that's, that's the way about it. Um, I will say it was a tough transition though. Um, they have an RCI pro process where, I'm sorry, yeah, R R I don't even know, right of Christian initiation for adults. Yeah, that's RCIA. Uh, I actually went through it two different years mm -hmm. because I was still unsure. And it was like, well, this is radically different than where I came from. Same. Um, where I actually made the leap and in, in being confirmed and then, yeah. then looking into, you know, obviously the monastic life. Yeah. And so you became a Franciscan monk? A uh, Marianist monk. A Marianist monk, sorry. Marianist. Yeah. sorry. You, you strike me as Franciscan now. This is why I've, okay. <laughs> well, and my Catholic name is Francis after Francis of Assisi. And it was wow. actually, I would say if anyone converted me, it was him. So his stories and all of that, so. Definitely. And so what was your time in the Marianist order like for you? Um, you know, it, it's very interesting. Before I, I, I visited two different communities, and one was a Trappist mm -hmm. uh, community. And as you know, they're contemplative and have little to no access to outside life. It was in the Ozarks. Um, it was beautiful. They grew their own food. They had a river right next to the monastery that you could swim in. Um, and I was ready to sign up right then and there. I enjoyed the quiet. And then they talked to me. You realize the only time if you take vows, the only time you leave is if, when your parents die to visit their funeral. And perhaps maybe if it's a sibling. Right. And that scared me. I was like, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe I'm not ready for this. And so the Marianists actually, a lot of them teach seminary. They're very active in the community. And so that was why I went that route. Um, had it been the other way around, I probably would still be there. <laughs> Um, so, so, I, so was it that family life? Because I mean, I I know I, well. We we share a couple of friends from Oklahoma. Big families, big community, very very family centered. Was it that that was that just did it for you? As far as the Marianist family, or from yeah, um, I I loved it. Yeah, they were they were very loving, welcoming, community centered. Um, social justice centered, which it, I, you know, it was not emphasizing, you know, the Southern Baptist faith, but actually it's process when that awakened me to that aspect of things. Um, and I loved it. You know, I, I joked that I was the Maria, but if you've seen Sound of Music, because I couldn't follow the rules very well. Um, you know, we have times of grand silence where you're not allowed to speak and do that. And I'd get in trouble because I'd be talking or <laughs> playing music or something like that. Or, falling asleep during lessons and <laughs> yeah yeah but it was it was a good community and it was there that um i had a great spiritual director who actually helped me make peace with my sexuality a wonderful priest beautiful it says go and find someone and settle down god understands and wow. that was a revelation to me um to actually hear that and mm -hmm. that was actually the, what stepped me out of um or why you know caused me to step out of that and into back into the world 
and actually at that point it left Christianity behind too. <laughs> he may not have suggested it had he known that was the route, but I realized, you know, so much of the church is not welcoming, especially at that point in time. We're talking, you know, the early nineties and yeah. So began, still had that spiritual bent, still had that spiritual interest, but not so much within Christendom. Absolutely. And was it at this point that you turned to Kaula Shaktism? Yeah, so I began to read on different world religions, growing interested, and uh, one of them that fascinated me was Hinduism. Mm. Just simply that there's many different faces of God and many different names of God. Mm. Um, and I found that so beautiful. Yes. Um, and so the more I studied, I began to visit the temple here in Oklahoma and became friends with the priest. Mm-hmm. And he actually gave me, we went through a rite where you, you, you visit with an astrologer, a Vedic astrologer who gives you the first syllable of your name. It's called a seed syllable. And you receive your Hindu name. And that was kind of how they consider conversion. Again, it's, there's not an, actually a rite of conversion, but that's how they did. And from there began to look at possible spiritual teachers and had one that was actually very welcoming towards gay and lesbian people. Mm-hmm. And it was Kala Tantric, uh, Shakta. Mm-hmm. And so when you hear Tantra, don't, don't automatically think sex. That's it. here in America, that's the common thing. Oh, it's all about, no, it's that all of life is holy, even the ugly parts, uh, even those are, those are holy, those are sacred. And that's where like sex becomes sacred, mm-hmm. but so does going to the restroom become sacred right. and what comes out of you goes sacred. And that's, that's a harder part to accept, but um, it was beautiful. I enjoyed that time there. I spent three years as a monk um, mm-hmm. allowed to live in the world um, because again, you had to find a way, but every day um, I had spiritual exercises given to me by my guru and um, I had to report to him every single day. Right. Um, we wrote, we called, and we brought him down from Los Angeles um, several times to here in Oklahoma. Um, oddly enough, that formed a community in Eden and in Oklahoma City. Um, when people from all over come, come hear this guy, he's um, in some ways very humble, in other ways maybe not so humble, it's interesting. That's beautiful. And then that evolved into something else. It did. And, and how that happened is not to, to bash anyone, but it was, um, as in the case of many gurus or spiritual teachers, there, there was some missteps. And um, one time he came to visit and you know, the guru was having sex with someone else and the time watching me and the other brother take off our robes and it was just yeah it was not at that point i realized oh, oh. a little unhealthy right now yes right yeah. so even while I, I i still hold to a lot of those same beliefs uh the more of vedanta um yeah the, the practice of it was less so right 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 and that funneled into your current witchcraft practice yeah, so with that, you know, the, I, I still held to the idea, I still hold to the idea that spirit, God, whatever you call it, has many names, many faces, mm-hmm. and it will come in whatever name we call, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's nature, whether it's the tree, whether it's your beloved dog, the divine is there, and, um, and paganism in many ways answered that same thing, but in a very Western concept, yeah. which I understood a little better, which I was able to grasp, and Gosh, it's been a long, long time now that I've practiced and into the witchcraft I practice today. Absolutely. So in the witchcraft community, I mean, it's it's a difficult question I'm asking, I know, but in the witchcraft community, where where would you find yourself in all of that? Are there particular traditions that you kind of align with or? Um, You know, my first exposure was, was, Wicca, but it was a reclaiming witchcraft. I don't know if you're familiar with Starhawk and, and some of them. Um, they were the first. Of our, were... Sorry, I was going to say for okay. the of our, our, our listeners, I, I'm aware of them, but can you explain a little bit more about reclaiming? Absolutely. Um, reclaiming 
uh, tradition is very much social justice centered. Mm. Um, so they are strongly, um, whereas maybe traditional Wicca may lean, not all, not all of it, but much of it leans very heterocentric. Uh, God and goddess are a couple, they, they mate, they have, you know, it's this whole cycle built around that. Uh-huh. Reclaiming is not necessarily like that. It leans strongly towards a goddess spirituality, but it's very much um, stands on the side of the oppressed, the hurting nature, uh-huh. uh, in support of women, in support of gay and lesbian, transgender uh-huh. people. Um, and so their spirituality and their their way of living is is based on that. Right. Yeah. right. And that was a heavy influence for you in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Recognize that old Catholic influence. Isn't that funny that social justice still stuck after all that time? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so now you're, um, I understand you're connected with a temple now in, in Oklahoma City. Um, and, and there are, I mean, you do community outreach work as well, don't you? Yeah. And so the Labyrinth Temple here in Oklahoma City is a diverse community. It welcomes pretty much everyone mm-hmm. in different paths. And it, uh, a wonderful lady, Emma Eastwind, um, had an extra house and says, let's make it a temple. And so she, she donated it and we built, uh, built a labyrinth. We have a labyrinth you can walk. Uh, we recently added a shrine to Aphrodite. That now people from all over the city, you find prayers hooked up there and offerings left by random people that come and visit. It's, it's very neat. Um, and we have classes, we have workshops, rituals, drumming, just a little bit of everything for everyone. It, it seems like a real hub too. I, I um, uh, a few weeks ago or a month, I locked down, I don't know when time is, I have no idea. Um, but you had a member of the Order of Bards of Weeks and Druids, which I'm a part of, come onto your show. Mm-hmm. And um, ironically, that same week, she was also interviewed by our Order Chief, um, Emer. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there was uh, uh, quite a few people on her thread on our on our group page, um, talking not only about your uh, podcast but also um, being on on Emo's podcast too. So it's, it seems like you you draw a lot of. It is a very diverse community. Yeah, we have many. Um, there's several members of the Druid Order um, mm-hmm. there that are active and really part of the, the highest ranks. It's funny. So yeah, mm-hmm. every we have kitchen witches. We have. Um, maybe those that lean more towards Wicca, OTO, um, just everything. But yeah, I, I would say it's a very strongly druidic leaning, whereas Emma and I probably the more reclaiming side of things. But <laughs> yeah, we all get along great. It works. Absolutely. That's beautiful. So where do you find yourself in amongst all of that, both as a, a person, but also as a spiritual kind of leader of the community by the sounds of it? It's a funny thing. So I am an introvert uh, yeah. with, uh, with high social anxiety in person. It's very funny um, doing these public things or doing these, these events and then needing strong recharge time and very awkward around new people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in some ways, even in the midst of that community of doing all of that, part of me is always separate. Part of me is always not, not out of being mean or stuck up. It's just <laughs> that sense of... I do, I'll do my thing privately. <laughs> we'll do this for you. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yet there, there's also a, a, a piece around that where you do interact quite a lot with, with other people, but through kind of different venues, right? Yeah. Yeah. So podcast and, and Zoom and, I you know, do some chats. <laughs> well, let's all, go on, sorry. <laughs> No, just I'm just flabbing now. <laughs> um, I um, so let, well. Let's talk about your podcast then. Kind of, I mean, um, you debuted it. You're on episode what eight now, nine, something like eight or that? nine, yeah. eight or nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What what kind of what what persuaded you to step into that role of interviewer? And what you know, that's a, it's a funny question. I just interviewed Corey Hutchinson in my last one, and he asked that question. I don't really know. I had no interest in doing it. There was, it's, um, in, in the work I do, I do a lot of videography. I do a lot of creating things on Canva and, and graphic design. 
And I think as I'm doing more of that and learning, I think it was just an experiment. Can I do this? And then it took off and it was interesting and I really enjoyed doing it. And people seemed to like it. And I was surprised because I was just doing it just to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is some of the feedback that uh, you've been receiving about it? I mean, so far, so far, no hate mail. You know, I'm sure that's coming. But um, it's been a lot that people enjoy hearing other people's stories. And that's one of the things, I guess you understand that here. Absolutely. Yes, as well. Absolutely. It's the power of story, the power of people's journey. Um, mm-hmm. And then definitely having a spiritual, you know, interest. What does that look like for them? How did it evolve? Where are they at now? Where do they see themselves going? Yes. Um, and it's one other, you know, thing as far as in the witchcraft community is it's it's strongly female centered, um, and maybe rightfully so, considering you know patriarchy has had how many years <laughs> of controlling religion. But at the same time, there sometimes the the male voices are not heard at all, or maybe greatly diminished, and so. By accident, again, it wasn't planned that way. I've noticed I brought on a lot more male guests, um, mm-hmm. not at any planned you know, planned event, but it's been interesting to hear their journeys and their stories yes. um, and connecting with, with people who have similar stories or different even. Something just struck me, and I, I, I'm curious about it. Forgive me, but something you just said there about, you know, um, witchcraft being so um, strongly female devoted. Um, It strikes me that throughout your spiritual journey, you found yourself in those kind of female centric spaces, even if it was, you know, with a band of brothers, Marianite, uh, the Trappists, a Kaula Shakta tradition, which the Shakta tradition is the goddess tradition of Hinduism. Um, Created us to honor Mary front and center. Yes. You know, um, Talk to me a little bit about that because that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting observation. Um, so something I said at my first sermon at the temple, um, my mom was there and my coming out to her was much later than me being kicked out of the church. I still hit it. Uh, um, it was after my first breakup and I was heartbroken. And my mom calls me from Diamond to Oklahoma City and asks what's wrong. And I, that was when I told her everything. Well, she drove the five hours here to pick me up and bring me home for the weekend, just to love on me. And one of the things that stuck out to me was that's how God loves. Right. You know, and so to me, um, if I had any image of God, it would be that of a mother, yeah. unconditional. You know, it doesn't matter the story or the why, they're going to love. And that's what they do. I wholeheartedly agree. I think of times in my life where I've gone through um, emergency or, or issues and it was always my mom bringing me a cup of tea the next morning. You know? <laughs> she didn't want to hear what was the issue was. It was always just, here's a cup of tea. You know? Yeah. So where does that, where does that bring you in your future work then? Um, if you know what I mean. Hmm. You know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, largely now, my, my witchcraft and my devotion are very separate. Um, I didn't plan it that way. That's the pandemic, how things kind of happen. Um, the name of my podcast is New Moon Hearthcraft. And it's, so it's looking at the hearth and home, creating a, a space that is sacred and welcoming and safe and hospitable to visit, visitors. You know, that they always feel... They are at home, just like my mom would make sure anyone you're visiting here. You want something to eat? Are you hungry? I'll feed you. Are you thirsty? And so it's that safe space, that wonderful space, and infusing it with a little magic um, through the use of herbs or the the smells. I work with essential oils and things like that. And so that becomes largely my magic and my practice. Right. And then the devotional side to the goddess, the mother, Aphrodite, um, becomes somewhat separate, right. oddly enough. And again, none of that was planned. It just kind of started going that way. Yeah. Very organic process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's um, um, what you said about um, being that welcoming uh, facilitator. Um, you know, you're, uh, and I know you didn't want to talk about your, uh, your day job, um, but in that day job, you, you do have, I mean, it's a very facilitation background, right? Um, yeah. And even on your social media, like something that um, strike, strikes me every single time, every morning, I, you know, groggily open up Facebook and there's a question from Pax for all the people on his page. And you have a fair following on your Facebook group and, and your, on your Facebook um, profile, I should say. Um, and it's, it's a different question every single day, sometimes two. Um, what got you started asking those questions on your Facebook page? Um, and especially um, the number of people who respond, they love these questions. What got you started and how has that evolved for you? Um, so I have been doing it about seven years now, maybe almost eight. And how it started, I was with my partner for 16 years and he passed away of brain cancer. And at the time he passed away, my social anxiety was extreme to the point it was hard to even leave the house at all, except to go to work and come home. Um, and then he dies and, and in that process, losing everything. And I wasn't on, I think I may have had a Facebook, but I never posted one of those people, you know, just kind of lurk and maybe not even look at it for months on end. Um, I asked a question on there and I don't remember even what the original question was. And people answered I, and I didn't realize it was on public and people just like, and then the next day I asked another question about something again and people answered the, the third day, someone said, well, where's your question? Where's your, <laughs> and that's how it started. And it helped me uh, to start kind of overcoming my social anxiety. I remember reading books and watching videos on how to overcome it because I realized with my partner dying, I know no one. I don't really have any friends. I don't know how to connect to people. Um, and so reading those and part of it, you know, I remember reading somewhere that said, if you memorize these 10 questions, you can carry on a conversation because what would happen is I would freeze and I wouldn't know what to say. And then it would get awkward and that would be, I'd get out of there. Right. And so I memorized 10 questions to ask. And that helped me then started asking questions on Facebook. And that's how it started. Beautiful. Can I, can I ask you what those 10 questions are? Off the you know? Um, it was something like, it was questions that they were simple ones, you know, tell me three interesting things about you. Mm. What is something unusual that not many people know? Right. What, what are some of your favorite places? Things right. like that. Um, you know, now looking back eight years, I'm like, what were they? I'm sure if I thought, put my mind to it, I could come up with them. But they were along those lines. They weren't overly deep, but enough that it would gauge people to yeah. feel special, feel heard mm. not, not totally typical questions but enough that could spark conversation and maybe for an introvert like me could actually respond to it you know and, yeah that's, that's beautiful and and on what you like that that word heard right that is such a pivotal word for everybody everybody needs to be heard and a lot of people don't know how to hear that's that's an issue right over the past seven years and asking those questions, has anything surprised you? Have you had moments where even like either the response or coming back to the question, has it surprised you? Absolutely. Um, you know, I love asking the questions just simply to hear people's experience. Um, those are probably my favorite questions that go a little bit deeper. I don't ask them all the time. Um, you know, one where what was something that, you know, shifted your life or something like that. And people tell stories of abuse, of hurt, of rape, and, and things that will break your heart. Yes. And it gives, I don't know, me a, such a sense of empathy for them and a connection that I just want to reach my arms around them and just hold them, you know, till those pieces come back together again. Um, they make you laugh. They make you cry. They, so people have some crazy, crazy experiences, paranormal, whatever it may be, any, any type of experience. Yeah. It's, it's broadened my perspective because I have a worldview and they, it's challenged me to broaden it. Mm -hmm. um, for you know years, I felt like I had a lot of anger towards Christianity until I met some Christians who were a little more like Jesus and less like the church perhaps, but 
Have you surprised yourself with the type of question that you wanted to ask on a particular day? Have there been moments like that? Hmm. That's a hard one. I, I, I don't know if I have or not, to be honest. <laughs> I, I typically do them, as you say, early in the morning um, before I'm fully awake. Right. It's one of those things my, my mind doesn't stop. And so when I'm sleeping, there's something going on in there. And so when I get in, I'll, I'll throw, it up, throw it up in there. And so without a lot of thought necessarily, because that seems to be more natural than if I plan it. I can usually tell those questions going, yeah, that didn't, wasn't a great one. <laughs> I, I love, that's interesting because I, I i remember oh i and i have to preface this i have a very like deep memory for weird little things um but there was a a, a, a day with a, uh, there was a question that you posted and there was some a, a backlash or something people didn't appreciate the question or there was something that they didn't they misconstrued it or something like that and you came back with a second question later in the day and you could tell that that was a little bit more um, kind of pointed, I guess. Um, but uh, but it turned out that the first question was just misconstrued. Um, but it was it was uh, it was interesting how many people cared about about. I think you had like over like a hundred comments on that. Um, it is interesting. Yeah, I've I've tripped up a few times and got to you know get some ire. Mm -hmm. um, and those are interesting too because again, when you're asking a question, you're meaning it one way, mm -hmm. and the response is very different or something maybe you didn't perceive as offensive, and it is, and what a learning opportunity, a learning lesson right there. It's like, wow, okay, okay. Not every everyone in the world thinks like someone stuck here in the middle of Oklahoma. <laughs> Shocker. It's, it's quite a place. I mean, a mutual friend of ours constantly is always emailing me and messaging me about things that happen in Oklahoma with, you know, some crazy stories of his side of town. <laughs> Yeah, we know each other well, and we've been through some of those stories together. That's... Uh, he's, he's beautiful, one of my best, absolute best friends, he really is. Um, so then that brings me back, well, brings us kind of full circle. Um, with that piece about growing up in Oklahoma, now where you're sitting here 20, 30 years after you started your journey, what did you learn? What have you learned through all of this life what have you learned um, probably the lesson i'm learning still even but what i've learned um it's very easy to hide from the world yeah. and it, it's risky and scary to open up and engage it you risk your heart being broken you risk but um you you risk not experiencing life otherwise and so it's one of those things where I feel like I'm walking a tightrope and, um, you know, I want to experience all that the world has to offer. And sometimes that includes heartache, that includes sadness, that includes brokenness. Um, and this too is God. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. If, um, if uh, say, an 18-year-old growing up in a very conservative Christian background uh, might start to feel like, you know, they are uh, not heterosexual. Um, is there anything that you would say to them right now? That's a big one too, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, if they're a person of faith, a person, you know, that comes from a religious background, first off, that, you know, that God absolutely loves them just as they are, madly in love, and that no one of any religion can stop that. Mm. So, you know, rip that word God from the mouths of those who are hypocritical and judgmental and reclaim it for yourself. Discover experience. That would be part of it. You're absolutely beautiful. Don't compromise that for anyone. and Don't forget it. And then, like the slogan says, it does get better. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Um, I know I'm going to have you back at some point if our schedule allows it. Um, how can people connect with the podcast? Do you have any uh, websites? Of, um, wh wh how can people connect with you? So definitely I have a podcast. It's a New Moon Hearthcraft, and you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, several others, but I know those are the two main ones. And 
See, I wasn't prepared because I'm like, yes, I have a Facebook page and I'm going to bring it up right now while we're talking. I'll put it um, down in the show notes in the bottom perfect. and uh, make perfect. sure that, uh, that if people are, are interested in connecting with you, um, then they can find it down there. And, uh, and as I said, I am sure that I will have you back on the show um, in, uh, to maybe even talk about kind of, you know, revisiting some of the topics we talked about today. Um, thank you so much. It was really lovely to speak to you and finally meet you after like five years. I know. I know. We see each other on Facebook, but uh, don't talk much. No. no. Something we will change. Thank you again so much, Pax. Thank you so much. Yeah, you have to come visit so you know people down here. I know, I know, and I have to. I mean, once the border opens, right? <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.